Okay, it's a pleasure to be here um, on this blustery cold May day in, in after such a difficult winter. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to speak to you today and thank you for coming. Uh, I, find, I think it's an important part of what I do as a professor at York to be able to uh, feedback to you the kinds of uh, research and things that we do. When I say we, I mean myself and my students, and I'll be presenting some of the work that my students have done as well. And I think it's especially important uh, for you to see how your hard-earned tax dollars go toward supporting me, my students, our research, and you'll be the ultimate deciders as to whether you feel it's worthwhile. I hope you feel that it is, okay. So, um, as James said, I'm going to be speaking on chronic pain after surgery, epidemiology risk factors, and something called preventive analgesia. Today's talk is uh, good news, bad news, good news, bad news story. And actually, it's mostly a bad news story, but I'm gonna get the good news out of the way, okay, the good, very quickly, and the rest will be the bad news. So the good news is that the vast majority of people who undergo major surgery recover uneventfully. So within weeks or months after the surgery, they heal, they, return to their everyday activities, be that student, uh, worker, whatever, and usually with an increased quality of life, better than what they had before. So that is the good news. Okay. The bad news is that I believe we have an epidemic of chronic post-surgical pain. I mean, we clearly have an epidemic of chronic pain, but I hope to convince you today by my presentation, and I have a lot of slides with data and numbers and things like that, uh, we have uh, an epidemic of chronic post-surgical pain. We, we're learning more and more about the factors, the risk factors that predict the development of chronic post-surgical pain and its maintenance. But at present, we're a long way from being able to predict who will go on to develop pain and who's going to recover uneventfully. And as you'll see from what I present, one of the most robust predictors or risk factors is pain itself. So you'll see that the existence of pain before surgery predicts the development of long-term pain after surgery and that the intensity of acute pain after surgery also predicts it. But the question, as you'll see, is what is it about pain that's predictive? And I won't say anything more about that now. What I will say is that as with most chronic intractable pain problems, chronic post-surgical pain, when it's severe, has a way of lodging itself into the core of the person, and from there, having all sorts of negative downstream effects. So chronic post-surgical pain ruins lives. It ruins families, it leads to separation, to divorce, it leads to job loss. It leads to isolation. People stop coming around after the first month or so. It leads to worry, anxiety about what does the pain mean, about how am I going to be able to support myself and my family. It leads to depression and at times even to suicide. And so this is a slide by the Mexican painter Frida Kahlo. And there was a Hollywood movie, I don't know, eight or so years ago about her life, which I should tell you really was Hollywood. It exaggerated the good and it downplayed the pain. And she had had a number of very painful accidents in her life. Um, 
One of them, ultimately, that led to an amputation, a, a below knee amputation. And this is a picture from her diary. And uh, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, and I don't, but I do know the translation, what she's written here is feet. What do I need them for if I have wings to fly? And here's what she said. She said, they amputated my leg six months ago. They've given me centuries of torture, and at moments I almost lost my reason. I keep on wanting to kill myself. Never in my life have I suffered more. I will wait a little while. And then, so that's in February of 54, and in July, her last entry in her diary is, I hope the exit is joyful, and I hope never to come back, Frida. And her friends who were with her that evening were convinced that she had deliberately taken an overdose of the morphine that had been provided for her for pain relief because of the pain she had been in. So in the time that remains, here's what I would like to, to, to cover. Um, a bit on the epidemiology or the course of chronic post-surgical pain in adults and in children. And so you should note that it's bad enough to have chronic pain as a grown-up, but it's a tragedy when children develop pain after surgery and when it doesn't go away. And so we've done a bit of research on that, and I'll be presenting some of that to you, too. Um, I want to define what a risk factor and a protective factor is, and then present the data that we have in the literature that suggests or that, that identifies what these risk and protective factors are. And I've grouped them into this category of these categories. I won't be going over all of them because I don't have the time, but there are surgical factors that predispose one to develop pain in the long term more than uh, if that factor is present more than other people who don't have that factor. There are psychological, um, social environmental factors, cognitive neuropsychological factors, individual difference factors, and anesthetic and analgesic factors. And of all of those, it's the last one that is a protective factor. That is, there are things that anesthesiologists can do during surgery and before to minimize the risk of developing long-term pain, certainly to minimize the risk of developing acute pain, intense acute pain. And I should say that there is a debate in the literature. So my point of view is biased in favor of there are things that we can do. And I have interpreted the evidence as suggesting there are beneficial things, but not everybody is on the same page, so you need to know that. And then I'll conclude with a few ending comments. Okay, so as with most phenomena, it's good to have a mutually understood agreement about what it is we're talking about, and the same is true with chronic post-surgical pain. And there is a now a four-point definition of chronic post-surgical pain. And you'll see that they're, it's fairly straightforward, although two of the points are more important than the others. And I should say this slide here uh, depicts the only type of surgery that won't lead to, or the only type of disc surgery that won't lead to <laughs> cro chronic post-surgical pain. It's probably the most that statement, I will, I'm, I will be no more confident about saying anything else than that. OK, so what is it? Well, the definition. Um, obviously, pain must have developed after a surgical procedure. It must be of at least two months duration, which I think, and others too, think that might be a bit too short. Of course, it also depends on the type of surgery. Some surgeries heal much more quickly, like a hernia repair, as opposed to an amputation of a limb. So that's kind of debatable. But these last two points are important because 
they partly explain the wide range you'll see in, in the estimates of how frequently chronic post-surgical pain is said to occur, because there's a lot of variability. And it's important, at least in the research field, as well as clinically, to rule out other causes of the pain. So if one has had surgery for cancer and pain is present a year after, one needs to rule out the possibility that the cancer has recurred. If that's the case, as with chronic infections, then that isn't really post-surgical pain. That's pain that's arising from a new cause. And in the same vein, one needs to rule out the possibility that someone who has had pain before surgery and who has chronic post-surgical pain, that one makes sure that the pain they have in the long term isn't just a continuation of pain they had before. In terms of studying this <coughs> phenomenon of chronic post-surgical pain, this slide shows how complicated it can be because if one takes a lifespan approach, for example, you can look at surgery in infancy and then the subsequent development of pain later in infancy, in childhood and in adolescence, in adulthood and in old age. And likewise, you can study surgery in children and follow them. And this is really most of where the literature is. It's looked at surgery in adults and followed them mostly for one year, which most people would admit is not even a long time. Occasionally, there are studies that have looked at pain after five years. Those are very, very rare. But we know that pain persists for many, many years. And in the case of limb amputation, it's not uncommon to continue to have what's called phantom limb pain for 20 or 30 years. So I'll be presenting some of the work we've done in adults and some we've done in children and uh, adolescents. So my introductory comments suggested, not even suggested, stated we have an epidemic. We've got a big problem. So let's take a look at how big a problem it is. And I'm going to do this from two approaches. I'm going to look at a study that evaluated intense pain immediately after the surgery and then followed people for a year and then take the other perspective, which is to look at people who have already have chronic pain and see what the breakdown is for the reasons for the pain. So the first study was one done by Chris Hayes in Australia. And they studied about 5,000 people seen by an acute pain service while they were in hospital, and they evaluated them over a two-year period. They diagnosed the incidence of what was called acute neuropathic pain at 1 to 3%. So 1 to 3% of the patients that they saw immediately after surgery had this neuropathic pain. And the hallmark feature of neuropathic pain early on is a really high intensity. So this VAS equals 9 out of 10. VAS is a visual analog scale. Think of it as a 10 centimeter scale where you have no pain at one end, most intense pain on the other, and you just mark where your pain is along there. The average pain of these patients who developed acute neuropathic pain was a 9 out of 10, so that is really intense. So they followed them up uh, six months and 12 months later. You can see at six months, 78% continued to have pain. And at one year, 56%, say, so half of them, continued to have pain one year later. So the conservative estimate then for the 12-month incidence is that if we take 56% of the 1 to 3% and take 56 as 50, so that's one half of 1% to 1.5% of people will develop chronic post-surgical pain a year later. And this is conservative. Now, you might not think that that's a lot, a half of a percent. But if you look at the 
literature on how many people undergo surgery every year, and I have uh, data from the United States. We don't have this kind of data, or I couldn't find it in Canada. But this is uh, for, nine, for 2005, a National Hospital Discharge Survey. In the United States, more than 26 million surgical procedures were performed on patients in a hospital. So if we take 0.5 to 1.5 percent of 26 million, that is 30,000 to no, 300 and 130,000 to 390,000 cases of chronic post-surgical pain this year. But because we're talking about <coughs> incidence, which is a number of new cases, so that's 130 to 390,000 patients this year added to the 130 to 390 last year, added to the year before and the year before. That's, that's, that's huge. And it's conservative, I believe. If you look at children, the data show that six million surgical procedures were performed. So if we do the same, a half of 1% to 1.5 of six million is 30,000 to 90,000 new cases of chronic pain in children. Okay, so knowing now that there's a lot of people out there with chronic post-surgical pain, this won't come as a surprise to you. This was another large scale study, this done by Ian Crombie in uh, Northern uh, England and Scotland. And they also studied about 5,000 patients. This was a retrospective survey of, as I say, 5,000 patients. So from 10 chronic pain centers. So these are people who already have chronic pain and are being referred to a specialized pain center for treatment. And what you can see, and I think not surprisingly given the data I presented just before, almost a quarter of the patients who are referred to these pain centers suffer from chronic post-surgical pain. And then the rest is not surprising given that in order to get seen by a specialized pain center, you need to have had it for a while and it needs to be intense. 60% had it for at least two years. It was of moderate to severe intensity in three quarters. Uh, and again, not surprisingly, associated with a significant uh, disability or the, by disability is meant how much the pain interferes with everyday activities. And this is a smaller study done by one of my former graduate students, Andrea Martin, where we followed just over 140 kids who had been seen by a pediatric chronic pain clinic in Toronto. And we contacted them three years after they had been treated and discharged. And 62% reported their pain persisted. The mean intensity, this is a different scale, but it's uh, still a zero to 10, an 11 point scale. Uh, the average intensity of a 6.1 out of 10. And almost 17% had been referred because they had had surgery and the pain had arisen because of this. And this is pain that now is persisting. This slide here shows you what's called an inside out plot of the incidence on the left and the prevalence on the right of a variety of different surgeries and the incidence prevalence of chronic post-surgical pain that arises after them. So you can see that the 0.5 to 1.5 percent isn't even there. I mean, it, we're, ha we're talking about a greater incidence and in prevalence. And even for uh, surgeries like a hernia repair, where's hernia repair here, which is a, not a major surgery, it's a, a minor surgery, but we have um, 22 or so percent of patients after one year reporting a chronic pain referred to the inguinal area. I mentioned phantom limb pain, 80 percent one to two years later. There's work by a colleague of mine, 20 years later, people still having phantom limb pain after an amputation. And even after a post-C-section, one year later, about 
This slide shows the same thing, but for children. There, are, there isn't as much data, but it's equally alarming. And this is a study that we conducted, or one of my graduate students did. And here we have, one year after major orthopedic surgery, about 22% of kids reporting chronic post-surgical pain of moderate to severe intensity. That's like a four or more on that zero to 10 scale. So I wanna spend a bit of time on, on risk, on understanding risk, and by understanding risk, I don't mean the board game of global domination, uh, nor do I mean trying to understand why this fellow would do what he does. Uh, this is Alain Robert, who's the real Spider-Man, the human Spider-Man, who climbs the world's tallest buildings without any safety gear. And this is him reaching the top of the Aspire building in Qatar in 2012, which is 300 meters, uh, and he did in 73 minutes. And actually, from what I gather, this is an easy climb because you can see there's that metal grid. I mean, easy, I don't mean easy for me, but easy <laughs> for him. I mean, he, he has climbed buildings that are just solid concrete. Anyhow, I am not, even though I am a psychologist, I am not talking about understanding this. I'm, I'm talking about understanding the terms risk and protective factors and what they mean and how they're defined. So there are really two important parts to understanding what a risk factor is, even though there's four, a four-point definition here. So it needs to be, a risk factor needs to be something that you can measure in every person. And importantly, it has to be measured before the outcome of interest. So if we're talking about what are the risk factors for chronic post-surgical pain, and I say pain is a risk factor, we need to measure pain before surgery or after surgery, but certainly before the chronic pain develops, right? Uh, and then this risk factor can be used to divide the entire sample into people who are at high risk and those who are at low risk. And also another important point is that risk factors are then used to say, well, what is the probability? How much greater, how much more likely are you to develop the outcome if you're in the high risk versus the low risk group? And Risk factors are to be distinguished from these other things, which are called correlated factors. So if you don't measure it before the outcome, if you, for example, just decide, I'm gonna call up a thousand people like they did in that retrospective study, and I'm gonna ask all of them who has chronic post-surgical pain, and then say, by the way, did you have pain before surgery? Yes or no you're measuring whether they had pain before surgery after. So it isn't a risk factor, it's a correlated factor, and in that instance it might even be an, a, a consequence of, well in this case it can't be, but it can be a symptom. So we need to distinguish correlated factors from risk factors, and then there are correlated risk factors. And that, those are risk factors that precede the outcome, but if you try to change them or modify them, like for example, let's decrease pain and see if that does something in the long term, if modifying the risk factor has no effect, then it's called a correlated risk factor. If modifying a risk factor, removing pain before surgery, for example, if that changes the risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain, then you have what's called a causal risk factor. And this is what we're looking for. Not only us, but anyone who does this kind of research is looking for causal, modifiable risk factors. So some risk factors are correlated. So no matter how much you modify them, it has no effect on the outcome. We're not that interested in those. So here are the various categories of risk factors. And as I mentioned before, if you think of 
the term protective factor. It's the same thing as a risk factor, but it's something that's good, right? A protective factor protects against the development of the, of the outcome. And if the outcome is pain, then that's a good thing. So I'm going to just go through some of these, some of the surgical risk factors. The duration of surgery. So the longer the surgery, the more likely a person is to develop pain in the long term. This you want to take note of. You have a 13% increased risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain if you have surgery in a low volume versus a high volume surgical unit. Why might that be? They're in a hurry. They're in a hurry. Maybe an experience, right? The more, the more patients going through, the more experience, the less likely. But this is only one study. Uh, you're at greater risk. This is for hernia repair for chronic pain, groin pain, if you have what's called an open approach versus a laparoscopic approach. So open is where they, this is how surgeries were done traditionally. They make an incision and they take out or fix whatever they need to do and then they sew you back. And laparoscopic surgery involves uh, very small incisions and then doing the surgery uh, through some mechanical means where you don't have to make a huge incision. Uh, something called pericostal versus intracostal stitches for thoracic surgery, mostly for uh, lung cancer. And I think all of these point to the main culprit. And the main culprit is nerve damage or nerve lesion during surgery. Either in a, in, um, <coughs> advertent or accidental, as in the case of when uh, a nerve might get nicked during surgery, or uh, a nerve might get tied up in a suture, or intentional and unavoidable in the case of limb amputation where major nerve trunks are ligated, tied, and then cut. So there are times where you can't help it, and there are times where you can. And so in terms of what we know, Definitely, intraoperative nerve damage is a risk factor for chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, is it modifiable? Well, in some instances it is. For example, if uh, the surgeon cuts a nerve to get a better view of the operative field, that's uh, avoidable and that probably shouldn't be done. Uh, in other cases, it isn't. And is it causal? Yes, most of my colleagues would agree. In fact, most of the animal models that basic science researchers have for studying and trying to understand and improve pain in humans, they use animal models, involve damage to nerves. Okay, psychological and emotional factors. Well, fear of the long-term consequences of surgery. So if you're worried about surgery beforehand, your risk is increased for long-term pain. If you're depressed before surgery, your risk is increased. If you engage in something called pain catastrophizing, which is worrying a lot about the pain, feeling helpless in the face of pain, your risk is increased. And then there's other factors that we measure, not necessarily before surgery, but at points in time after surgery that also predict the development of chronic post-surgical pain, and pain disability is one. Something we've called sensitivity to pain traumatization. Some people are really afraid of pain. They get traumatized by it. And this construct predicts the development of pain a year later. And I won't talk about this right now. So again, the only factor, the most clear-cut finding is this construct called pain catastrophizing. This worrying about pain, feeling, feeling helpless in the face of pain, is a risk factor. We know it's modifiable because through psychological techniques, such as cognitive behavior therapy and others, we can reduce people's level of worry and concern. The question is, will reducing that change the outcome? And we don't know that yet, though I do know a colleague of mine at McGill is doing a study to look at this. <coughs> 
This is the most robust finding in the field. The ones highlighted in, in bold-faced font all have to do with pain. And I said this at the beginning. Pain predicts pain. There is, no, there is no other factor that is more predictive of pain than pain itself. So the intensity of preoperative pain, the presence of preoperative pain predicts the development of long-term pain. The intensity of acute pain predicts the development of long-term pain. A high consumption of, analgesic, of analgesics after surgery, which is a proxy for intense pain, is also predictive as is pain in other body parts. The younger age, female sex is not, it hasn't really panned out. There's probably an equal number of studies that show that that isn't the case. But the biggest factor is pain itself. So let me give you an example of, <coughs> excuse me, of what we mean by pain predicting pain. Yes, it's modifiable, but we don't know if it's causal. This is a very small scale study we did several years ago where we interviewed and assessed patients immediately after thoracic surgery and then followed them for 18 months. So we contacted them 18 months after and asked them, did an interview about whether they had developed chronic post-surgical pain and if they had, how intense it was. So Almost half were pain-free, and the other half reported pain on a daily or weekly basis, a dull, aching, or burning pain, which is characteristic of neuropathic pain, and it had a mean intensity on that 0 to 10 scale of a 3.3. So what we then did was, after classifying them as pain-free or having pain, we went back to the records that we had collected when they had surgery and looked at what their pain scores were immediately after. So here you can see on the y-axis, which is the up and down one, this is pain 0 to 10 at rest, just lying down as comfortably as one could be after the surgery. And what you can see is that as early as six hours after surgery and going up to 24, the people who reported themselves to be pain-free 18 months later had significantly lower pain than the ones who went on to develop pain. So as early as six hours later, one can predict, at least based on these, who is more likely to develop long-term pain. And likewise with um, what we call pain on movement. In this case, it's because the incision is done here, taking a deep breath, stretches the stitches and causes pain. We don't want to cause pain, but it's good to move about after surgery. So pain on movement is also predictive of long-term pain. So the people who had a lot of acute pain after taking that deep breath were the ones who went on to develop long-term pain. And this was in the face of no differences in analgesic consumption. So this is milligrams of morphine that the two groups took, and they took basically the same amount, which itself is a mystery, actually. And this study we just published last year, done by another grad student, Gabrielle Paget of mine, who's almost done and ready to move on, um, looking at a very similar thing, but in children. And these were children who had undergone um, major uh, orthopedic surgery, um, mostly for uh, spinal stenosis. So we did the same thing. We saw them right after surgery. We followed them up two weeks, six months, and a year later. At the one-year mark, we classified them into a high-pain group and a no or low-pain group. And then we went back and looked at what were their pain scores like early on. So here's what we found. We have two graphs, pain intensity, how strong, how intense, what is the magnitude of the pain, and what we call pain unpleasantness, how much does it bother you, how unpleasant is it. And you can see the graphs are pretty much the same. What you can see is that um, these 
closed circle dotted lines are the patients who at one year had no or mild pain and the open circles are the patients who had moderate to severe pain. Right? So what you can see is that the two trajectories, this one going down and this one kind of going up or staying constant, the main difference occurs at about two weeks after surgery. And so what we found was that kids who had a pain score of three or more on that scale were two and a half to three times more likely to go on to develop a moderate to severe pain one year, six months to one year later than the kids whose pain was less than three at two weeks. So here we have it again, pain predicts pain. And I must say a lot of my colleagues, or not a lot, but you know, some jumped on these findings and said, okay, well now we have the answer, right? Pain predicts pain, all we have to do is get rid of pain. If we get rid of pain before, we're not gonna have any pain, but that's assuming that pain is a causal risk factor, and we don't know if it is. It might be, and I'm gonna show you more about this. So this is actually what we teach our, you know, Psych 101 students, the difference between correlation and causation. Just because two things occur together doesn't mean that one is causing the other. And so this is the million dollar question. What is it about pain that predicts pain? So if you think about other things in your life that predict itself, you'll see why it might not be so clear cut. So a good example is height. Long babies turn into tall kids, turn into tall grown-ups, right? Uh, no one would say that height causes, like height as a baby causes you to be a tall adult, right? They're just correlated. Why? Well, it must be your genes. Or school performance. Doing really well in grade school predicts doing well in high school predicts doing well in university, and no one would say that doing well in grade school causes you to do well, and so likewise with pain. But for some reason, it's a bit harder to tease those two apart, but we're going to do it as best as we can. So these, and I'm not gonna go through them all, but these are some of the um, risk potential risk factors for why pain predicts pain, some of the explanations. They're, they're non-mutually exclusive, meaning that more than one can be happening at, one, at the same time. Some of them are causal, some of them are correlated, and some of them are modifiable and others are not. So I'm just gonna go through maybe one or two but if we take an example of nerve damage that I said is probably a culprit. So if there is nerve damage during surgery, that causes immediate pain after surgery, and then something called ectopic activity where the nerve starts to fire uh, from a site that it doesn't usually fire, and that gives rise to pain. So in this case, we have a causal risk factor um, which is at least at present not modifiable by any of the known drugs that we have, at least known drugs that can be given clinically. Um, central sensitization, this is a, a, one of our buzzwords in the field. Uh, when a nerve is injured, it emits a high frequency burst of, of activity that can be recorded and associated with that high frequency burst of activity is a release of a neurotransmitters called excitatory amino acids and neuropeptides. These are released from the um, central ends of the nerve that then leads to a sensitization, an increase in the response properties of the neurons that it has just released its neurotransmitters onto. And this central sensitization is accompanied by 
feelings, perceptions of increased pain. So this is causal and it is modifiable. So if it's maintained by peripheral input, maybe we can block the peripheral input. Genetic factors. Well, that would be causal and that would not be um, modifiable, at least at present. So let me give you an example of, let me just go back here, sorry. A another one is structural changes in the central nervous system. Things we've called pain memories that occur in amputees, or others have called the centralization of pain, where pain becomes uh, autonomous. It doesn't require the periphery to drive it anymore. And these pain memories, here's an example. If you ever have time, I would suggest you see a website by Alexa Wright. This is her, she's a, um, a photographer and an artist who teamed up with a neuroscientist by the name of Peter Halligan from the UK. And they together interviewed a number of people who had undergone amputations. And you can see what she did here is she took a picture of the intact limb, in this case, uh, her right hand, and she flipped it digitally, and then based on her interview and the descriptions that each person had given her about what her phantom limb felt like, she made the phantom look exactly as it feels. So um, this is a phantom limb, that is, it isn't her real limb, her arm has been amputated right here. But this is what she feels. This is the phantom limb, right? You all, have you all heard of phantom limbs before? Yeah, okay. So you, you'll see this is a good example of this pain memory because you can see, well, here, here's what she said. She said at the time of the accident, she was in a car accident and the car flipped over and her arm was outside of the car. At the time of the accident, I was aware that my engagement ring cut into my finger and that is still there. So part of her phantom limb involves feeling an engagement ring, which you can see here as she feels it. And this is continuing to cause her distress. So this is an example of what we call a, a, a pain memory. It isn't a memory as in the memory I can remember, although it is partly that as well, it's also, not only can I remember the pain that I felt, but I also can feel the physical sensory sensations that I had at the time. So this is the million dollar question. Why is it important to distinguish between the causal risk factor model and the correlated risk factor model? The causal risk factor model says that, for example, Pre-amputation pain leads to phantom limb pain, right? By changing the central nervous system so that it stamps in or etches in an existing impression and that that comes back literally to haunt the person after an amputation. Versus the correlated risk factor model, which says that, um, for example, a psychological predisposition is what is responsible at both times. So a good example is anxiety. If you tend to be highly anxious at one time in your life, you may be highly anxious at another. And one would again never say anxiety at time one is causing anxiety at time two. Okay, so why is it important? So the next sequence of slides will give you an idea. So if the intensity of preoperative pain causes chronic pain, as in the case I just gave you of a pain memory, or if the intensity of acute postoperative pain, say in the days after surgery, is also causally responsible for developing chronic pain, either through this injury barrage that I didn't really talk about and uh, the inflammatory response, then 
a logical hypothesis is that if you perform an anesthetic block, like for example what the dentist does or what an, an epidural is a good example of that, if you perform an anesthetic block sufficiently in advance of surgery, and for example if you continue it throughout the surgical post-operative stay so that you block any pain, then you should render the patient or the person pain-free. Right? Because if there is no pain to persist, then there can be no pain in the long term. It's like in, in psychology we talk about declarative memory. So a good example is the best way to forget is never to have learned in the first place. Yeah? So this is kind of the same idea. Let's block pain and the transmission of it before surgery and throughout and see what happens. And if it's causally related and pain is responsible, this should help. But what if that isn't the case? What if we have what's called a correlated risk factor model, where the intensity of acute pain is associated with the development of chronic pain, but it doesn't cause it. They just both occur together. And that each one of those is themselves caused by some higher order factors, maybe genetics, nerve injury, catastrophizing, that are the causal mechanisms. So in that case, no amount of blocking of the pain is going to have any effect on it because it isn't causing it, right? And as with most things, uh, the world is much, much more complicated than simple models and I think we have a duo factor mo model where, where some aspects of, of acute and preoperative pain are causative and others are just associative and our task is to try to figure out which is which. So this is, and I don't expect you to be able to read it, I just want you to admire the artwork. <laughs> I'll tell you, it took me like a long time to do this. But what it reflects is the risk and protective factors, that, the known risk and protective factors that are involved in pain becoming chronic. And it shows these risk factors in the preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the acute and long-term postoperative pain. The factors that predict pain and pain disability. And you can see they're biological, psychosocial, the surgical factors. Um, so it's a complicated story. And now I'm going to highlight just one circuit of that model. And this is the circuit of what's called preemptive or preventive analgesia. This is where I said there are things that might be able to be done by anesthesiologists that can help in minimizing the intensity or the incidence. Um, so let's look at a few of these studies. So. Um, here you can see these are studies that have shown that giving, for example, an epidural, which I think, are you all familiar with an epidural? It's like a catheter is inserted into the epidural space. M many women have epidurals for childbirth, for labor pain, and uh, a local anesthetic or an opioid, a morphine-like um, substance is an opioid and a local anesthetic is like lidocaine what the dentist used to freeze you. Those agents are injected into the epidural space and they block transmission of nerve impulses at the level of the spinal cord. So if you have a really, really effective epidural, um, it will tremendously cut down on the pain or the pain impulses that are traveling up to the spinal cord. So using perioperative epidurals, meaning giving it before surgery and continuing it throughout, has been shown to reduce the incidence and intensity of chronic post-surgical pain. Likewise, something called multimodal analgesia, which is administering different agents by different routes, so com combining the actions of different agents like opioids, local anesthetics, non-steroidal an anti-inflammatories, things called alpha-2-delta ligands, gabapentin, and pregabalin. Uh, 
has been shown to be effective as well, as have these other studies. So I'm just about running out of time because I want to leave some time for comments. And I'm going to just, um, if you're interested, we published a paper in 2011 in anesthesia and analgesia called Preventive Analgesia Quo Vatimus, Where Are We Going? And it's not, I mean, there is a lot of science in it, but it is definitely readable. Uh, and it outlines the work that's been done over the past 20 or so years. So let me finish by giving you, telling you the results of a study we carried out a few years ago, testing this idea of preemptive or preventive analgesia. And this was in women who were undergoing uh, mostly, well, it's abdominal gynecological surgery by laparotomy, so it would be mostly uh, abdominal hysterectomies. And here's the, how the study went. People were recruited, informed about the study, assessed before, and then randomly assigned in what's called a double-blinded manner. So neither we, the researchers, nor them, the, the patients, knew what group they were going to be assigned to, though they did know what the three groups were. They just didn't know what they were going to get. And there were three groups. Group one received, through the epidural route, two syringes. One syringe contained fentanyl, which is a very potent, fast-acting opioid like morphine. And the second one contained lidocaine, which is like the same agent that the dentist uses to freeze you. Group two received two syringes containing epidural saline. So this is a control or a placebo condition. And group three, I won't go into it now, but they received what we called a sham epidural. So an epidural was not inserted, but the anesthesiologist went through all the motions of doing it. They didn't actually insert the catheter. Um, everybody had general anesthesia, as is the standard of care and the standard practice for this type of surgery. So these groups are actually, this group is actually getting more than the standard. And then I would say about 40 minutes into the surgery, groups one and group two were crossed over. So group one that received the active agent before now receives two syringes of epidural saline. And group two that received the saline now receives the active ingredients, the fentanyl and lidocaine. And this group receives two more injections into nowhere. And then surgery ends, and we follow them for several days, and then for um, three weeks and six months after. So just to review, the only difference between group one and group two is the timing of administration of the active agents relative to incision, right? Group one is blocked, if you will, at the time the surgeon makes the incision. The, the cut is made, the nerves actually do conduct their electrical signal, but they're stopped at the level of the spinal cord because of the epidural. So nothing, not much gets in, in terms of that injury <coughs> discharge, that central sensitization thing I talked about. Group two and three, on the other hand, well, there's nothing in those syringes, and general anesthesia doesn't block this injury discharge from being transmitted throughout the near axis. And so they receive the full brunt of the effects of the surgical incision, that release of excited amino acids, that central sensitization. So it's sort of stopped in this group, if you will, after, but they've received 45 minutes of that injury discharge. So everybody's clear on the design. So what do we expect? Well, we expect this group to have less pain than this group, certainly, and possibly even this group. So let's see what we found. Well, in contrast to what I just said, pain scores were not different between the three groups or among the three groups. But what I forgot to tell you was that everybody received what's called a PCA pump, a patient-controlled analgesia pump, where they're hooked up to uh, a pump that, is, um, that dispenses uh, morphine. 
Every time you press a button, subject to a lockout and safety factors, you get a bolus dose of morphine. So you can self-administer it. And I think that is why we had no differences in pain, because people are using the morphine pump to titrate their pain, and you'll see the results. But if we look at m the movement pain, we had a significant, a slight but significant difference at 24 hours between the patients who got the pre operative epidural, those are these here, they have significantly less pain than the control sham epidural control group. And the thing to note that this is at 24 hours after surgery, which is at a point in time when the clinical duration of action of the, of the fentanyl and lidocaine have long worn off. So this is no longer uh, an analgesic effect. This has to do with blocking the central sensitization that arises in this group here. We also looked at pressure sensitivity near the wound by poking at it, basically, and this represents the log milligrams of pressure of force. And here, too, you can see that the threshold is much lower, or I don't know if it's much lower, but it is statistically significantly lower, lower meaning you feel more pain, higher meaning you, have, you can take more pressure, again, at 24 hours, favoring the pre-incision over the control group with the post group is sort of intermediate, never, never different from either group. And here's where the main effect is, as I mentioned before, which is in the morphine consumption. So this shows an hour by hour plot of how much morphine cumulatively uh, each of the three groups took over time. And you can see that if we just go to uh, the 48 hour mark, which is when they were stopped uh, on the PCA pump, the patients who had the pre-operative -ep, pre or pre-incisional epidural had lower morphine consumption by 22% compared to the sham epidural group. And again, we have this post-incisional group is intermediate between the two. So this clearly says doing something before surgery in terms of administering local anesthetics and, and, and opioids through the epidural route has a beneficial effect that can be observed 48 hours, up to 48 hours after surgery. Um, so then we follow them up three weeks later and six months after that, and I'm gonna show you only the three week data because there was no effect at all at six months and a little, only a little effect that had persisted at three weeks. And so these are the variables that we measured. Follow-up time didn't differ between or among the groups, which is what we would expect. The incidence of pain is by and large the same. Worst pain since they were discharged, just about the same. Another pain rating scale, about the same. Uh, mental health inventory, about the same. The only difference we found was in something called the pain disability index, which measures as I mentioned before, how much pain do you have? How much does pain interfere with your everyday activities? And here we had this interesting effect, which was that it didn't matter whether you had received the epidural before or after incision. It mattered that you had gotten it. So receiving the epidural, whether before or after, led to people reporting less disability three weeks later than patients who had received the sham epidural. And then this slide here just shows, if we had not, I like to show this because if we hadn't include that third group that received nothing, this would have been what's called a negative trial. And then people would have read it and erroneously concluded, well, you know, there's no difference between giving it before or after, so it doesn't matter whether you give it, which is really not the right conclusion. So, speaking of conclusions, a uh, conservative estimate of the one-year incidence of moderate to severe chronic post-surgical pain is 0.5 to 1% in adults. But as you saw, that is really conservative. And it seems to be higher in children, but there's only that one study this, this, at this point. Um, interoperative nerve transection and injury is a causal, sometimes non-modifiable risk factor that should be avoided at all costs. The presence and severity of pre and acute pain are risk factors for uh, 
the development of long-term pain in grown-ups and in children, but we still really don't know is it causal or not, or what, part, what aspects are causal. Uh, pain catastrophizing is a risk factor for chronic post-surgical pain, and in some cases, preemptive or preventive analgesia can have a beneficial effect in minimizing the likelihood that pain transitions into chronicity. So uh, with that, I want to thank you very much. I, it's, a, it's an hour now. I apologize for talking for so long, but thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.